My name is Christina Forster, and I am an MS navigator at the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and my background is in employment. I'm very excited to be here today with all of you and talk about some planning for an unpredictable future, specifically with employment and financial planning. We're going to look at disclosure decisions in the workplace and talk about accommodations, how to communicate with your employer, and some different resources that are available to you to help, as well as some tips on financial planning. I'm going to start with what we do know about employment and MS. Um, we've done various research studies over the years and have learned, you know, we've been able to take a closer look at employment concerns for individuals with MS and how MS can impact employment. And what we know is that the majority of people do have work experience and are working at the time of diagnosis. But if you take a look several years down the line, the majority are not working anymore. Um, these numbers have improved. There were some studies that were done in the 1980s that showed that about 30% were still working several years after diagnosis. And they've likely improved the percentages through the various treatment options that are available today, um, also legal protections, as well as more awareness on how to manage MS on the job. We have also learned through the years that several people will leave the workplace prematurely and voluntarily, and there are several factors that are involved in this. Um, many reasons that we've heard over the years include not knowing about legal protections, concerns around disclosure and accommodations, unpredictability of symptoms, maybe a loved one trying to encourage you to leave work because they see that you're so stressed at work and hoping that that will help with stress, but there are other things that can come along with that. Um, also transportation issues and just not knowing where to turn to for assistance and guidance. If you think of employment along a continuum, as you see here, different career transitions, um, you, people move back and forth between these steps. It's not usually this linear, um, you know, you can move among the steps, between the steps, and the type of support and information and resources that you're going to need may change as you progress through these different steps. And we know that employment is important for everybody. Um, it's more than just a paycheck. It's a way to be involved in the society and maybe increase your self-esteem. Um, oftentimes, employment is connected with different benefits like health insurance and private disability. So there are a lot of important factors about employment more than just getting a paycheck. And another thing is um, we know that MS impacts work, but work can also impact MS. And as newly diagnosed individuals living with MS, it's really important to get educated and to know all available options to you and exhaust them before considering leaving the workplace. And if you think about MS as an adult onset condition, most of the time we do know that there's pediatric MS, but a lot of times we see that people are, uh, they have advanced degrees, they've been working in their careers for quite a while, working up the career ladder, and then their MS symptoms may change, which may impact their ability to stay in their chosen career. And because of that, they may need to start thinking about looking at employment differently. Um, some people may continue to work full time. Maybe they look at a career transition, something else that may be a better fit for them and the symptoms that they're experiencing. Sometimes people will begin to work part time because their symptoms are getting in the way and they may have accommodations in place. Maybe fatigue is causing them not to be able to work a full day so they start to work part time. But I think the important takeaway is um, to not make any rash decisions. Especially as somebody who's newly diagnosed, um, there are options and there are resources available to you. So connect with the resources and the professionals. Educate yourself about your options so that you can make an informed decision about employment. I did want to take a few moments to speak briefly about some of the key legal protections 
I'm not going to go into great detail about them, but I will show you some resources where you can get some additional information. And the first one's the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990 and then later amended in 2008. It's a civil rights piece of legislation and is designed to allow full participation of individuals with disabilities in the community. And there are different sections or titles to it, and Title I is the one that focuses strictly on employment. So the ADA applies to employers with 15 or more employees and ensures the right to request reasonable accommodations. And a person still needs to be able to do the essential functions of their job, whether that's with or without reasonable accommodations. There are some states that offer protections for uh, similar to that of the ADA that are for employers with smaller number, like less than 15. Unfortunately, Georgia is not one of them. Um, but we do know, uh, for instance, Pennsylvania, where I'm from, you need four employees in order to get similar protections to that of the ADA. There's also the Family Medical Leave Act, which can offer job protection. Um, it can, if you need to step out of the workplace temporarily for a medical condition, or maybe you're caring for a loved one, it's something that you can utilize. You do have to be with the company for a certain amount of time, uh, one year, and you have to work a specific number of hours, and there need to be 50 employees in order for family medical leave to be an option. And it does allow for up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave, and there may be some states that offer greater protection, so just check your state to see, and whichever one is greater, that's the one that you will get. Um, but if you do need to take some time off of work because of MS, and you're worried about exhausting your paid time off, the FMLA can be a way to help you maintain your employment. And it doesn't need to be used all at once. It can be used intermittently. Um, excuse me one second. <laughs> uh, disclosure is something that comes up again and again. And especially when thinking about tapping into these legal protections such as the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it's definitely something that you wanna get educated on. So we're gonna take a closer look at that. But first I did wanna do a polling question to see for the individuals in the room, anybody, uh, individuals with MS who have disclosed to their employer at some point, can I see a show of hands? Okay. And are there any individuals with MS who have never disclosed to an employer? Okay, so some of each, all right. Disclosure is a major concern for many individuals living with MS. And we know that talking about MS can be difficult. Um, discussing personal information with anybody can be highly stressful, especially with an employer. And there are risks involved. Um, one of the greatest fears is the fear of losing your job if you disclose. So we always encourage individuals to really take time to carefully think about it, plan it, and determine if it is right for you. Um, some individuals, they may experience invisible symptoms. They don't need accommodations on the job right now, so they decide that they don't want to disclose right now. Um, sometimes individuals may use a scooter or a cane and feel the need to explain why they're using them. And then there's other individuals that do need reasonable accommodations, so they need to explain why they need that help. But whatever the reason is for telling or not telling the employer, know that it is a really individual decision to make. Um, no two people are the same and everybody's situation is a little bit different. So you wanna think about that, the pros and cons for your situation. In order to request workplace accommodations, a person does need to disclose information about their disability related limitations. And that could include the diagnosis. But a person with MS, you can determine the initial extent of the amount of information you're going to share, but do know that the employer does have the right to request additional information if they need it to determine the disability and the need for the accommodation. Again, the decision to disclose is yours to make. Um, it's important that you become educated about your rights and you think about those pros and cons in your situation, making a decision that's right for you. 
it can be helpful to think about what's going on right now that's making me think that I do want to disclose. Um, <clears throat> the only legal reason that an individual would need to disclose is if they are asking for an accommodation. But there can be a lot of different emotional or practical reasons to disclose or not disclose that need to be considered. And remember that once that information is out there, it's out there and you can't take it back. But if you have decided that you do want to disclose, you're gonna also wanna think about who to disclose to and when to tell. And that's really gonna vary from person to employer when that will be. And that comes back to taking that time to carefully think about you know, if you're going to disclose, when you're going to disclose, and to whom you're going to disclose. There are several advantages to disclosing. Um, sometimes individuals may feel like they're being dishonest. Maybe they have invisible symptoms, they don't need accommodations right now, but they're, they're stressed out because they're feeling dishonest with their employer, so they decide that they want to disclose. It can also be a way to help educate others about MS. You know, a lot of times with working with individuals, um, the employers don't necessarily know that much about MS, so sometimes it's important to educate them so they understand it better. And if you disclose, you're opening up that line of communication. So even if you don't need an accommodation right now, You've opened that line of communication, you've started the dialogue, so if a time comes when you do need an accommodation, then you can just request that accommodation. There are also disadvantages to disclose and to take into consideration. Um, a lot of fear. You know, fear of rejection, fear that an employer is going to think you're not able to do your job, fear of being held back from promotions or fear of being seen as different. And these are all valid concerns to take into consideration. So I can't stress enough, disclosure is something that you definitely wanna spend time thinking about and planning for because once it's out there, it's out there and you can't take it back. But if you've decided that you wanna disclose, we do encourage individuals to um, kind of put together a script and practice it. And when you're putting together this script, you, you wanna use easy to understand language. You don't wanna have it full of tons of medical terminology. You don't wanna put your entire history, medical history in the script. You just wanna keep it short um, and keep it positive. We do have a formula that we use. It's pretty simple, but it's very effective. Um, so first, there's four steps to it and First is kind of determining how much information that you're going to disclose. And remember, the employer can ask for additional relevant information if it's needed. And then you wanna relate it to your symptoms. How does fatigue, how does vision, how does mobility impact your ability to do your job tasks? And then provide accommodation ideas. And when you're providing accommodation ideas, you wanna have, um, you wanna to come to the table with solutions and also have some backup solutions. Your employer doesn't need to give you exactly what you ask for, and it's an interactive process, so there could be some back and forth of you know, determining what is the best fit. And then always finish on a positive note. How is, you know, how is having an accommodation going to help you be more productive and successful at the job, as well as how is it going to help your employer? I have a sample script here that you guys can take some time to read later if you would like. And you can see when you read it that the four components that I just talked about are in this script. But I'm not gonna read through it right now, but please take a look at it later. So I've mentioned reasonable accommodation several times, but what really is a reasonable accommodation? Essentially, they're modifications to the work environment or to the way that a central job function is done. And having reasonable accommodations can help an individual stay successful in their job for longer periods of time and optimize their employment options. Accommodations do need to be reasonable and they can't cause undue hardship on the employer. And that's really gonna vary from employer to employer what that looks like. And employers only have to accommodate known disabilities. So in other words, an individual does need to disclose in order to request accommodation or receive accommodations. And that can be done orally or in writing. 
There have been many creative ways to accommodate MS symptoms on the job, creating more opportunities for individuals with MS to remain in the workplace longer. And that includes accommodating some of the most complex symptoms like fatigue and cognitive symptoms. It includes accommodating physical symptoms or visible symptoms as well as invisible symptoms. And some examples of accommodations could include having a desk in a quieter location, um, working from home, flexible work schedule, com computer technology, having a desk closer to the bathroom. I mean, I could go on about accommodations and examples of them, but I just want to tell you a few to kind of get you thinking and, and know that there are many practical ways to accommodate MS on the job. And the right solutions is really gonna vary from person to person and can vary over time for one person. No two people are the same, no two jobs are the same, no two employers are the same. So you really wanna do your homework, talk to your doctor, talk to a trusted friend or family member, reach out to the resources that are available to you to find the solutions that are right for you. Another polling question, um, are there individuals in the room who have requested accommodations before? Okay. And individuals who have never requested an accommodation? Okay, this is kind of, kind of close <laughs> to yes and no. So disclosure and accommodations are kind of big topics and I've, I just wanted to highlight a couple key takeaways before kind of shifting the focus a little bit. But with disclosure and accommodations, you do want to be open to questions and discussion. Um, again, it's an interactive process. There's supposed to be some back and forth and there may be some negotiating on what is going to work for you and your employer. Determine what is a must have versus something that you would like. Again, the employer doesn't need to give you exactly what you ask for, so have those backup solutions. Prioritize which ones are the most important to you. Also be open to trying an accommodation. Maybe, for example, you ask to have an accommodation put in place for 90 days, and then after 90 days, you and your employer revisit that to see, is that working for you and is it working for the employer? And do some changes need to be made or can things continue that way? I think I jumped ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, remember the win-win approach and how, you know, you want to be successful in your job, you also want to um, help your employer. Know that maintaining MS in the face of MS changes is possible. You want to be thoughtful and proactive about your approach. Um, plan for how you want to deal with um, disclosure and accommodations. And that really starts with understanding your legal rights and how you can tap into them and then understanding disclosure and accommodations and how you can connect to resources and determining best when and how to communicate with your employer. Success is possible. There's so many ways to help accommodate. Now I'm gonna just go over a couple programs and resources that can be very helpful for maintaining employment. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about other options of transitioning out of the workplace and some financial planning. The first one here is vocational rehabilitation, which is a state and federally funded program and every state has one. Um, their purpose is to help individuals with disabilities to help them gain, find, gain and maintain employment. Their services may vary a little bit from state to state, but generally you're gonna see things like assistance with um, vocational evaluations, psychoneurological psycho evaluations, um, vocational guidance and counseling, maybe some help with equipment that's gonna help you to do your job better, um, job placement and development assistance, maybe some assistance with training to help you get to your employment goal. A lot of states do operate under the, what's called order of selection. So that means that they're going to be given services. They prioritize services to individuals with the most significant disabilities. So you do want to check with your local office, see, you know, what that looks like. There can be long waiting lists sometimes. Um, so it's not, it, it, it's not the 
best resource if you're looking for a job like yesterday. But if you have a little bit of time and you're doing your job search or if you've been out of the workplace for a while, they have some really great resources that can be helpful to you. Another excellent resource is the Job Accommodation Network, or JAN for short. And JAN is a free service of the Office of Disability Employment Policy of the US Department of Labor. And it's a free consultant service. They have a lot of information about the Americans with Disabilities Act, about reasonable accommodations and entrepreneurship. You can call them and speak with a consultant and let them know the symptoms that you're experiencing and what job responsibilities you're having difficulty with and then they can help you to brainstorm accommodation ideas. And they can also talk to employers, which is really good because sometimes, you know, going back to thinking, you know, if you disclose and trying to educate your employer, they don't always know the best way to accommodate individuals with disabilities. So if they're willing to give Jan a call, um, they can get some additional resources. This slide just shows you how to connect with Jan. You can call them, you can go to their website, you can chat with them, um, you know, whichever method is best for you. And then there's just a couple articles on here that I highlighted because they do have some resources that are, resources that are specifically for individuals with MS and then some additional resources that can be helpful like a sample accommodation letter. So now I'm gonna shift a little bit again. Um, think back to that employment continuum and the different phases of employment. And there may be a time when you need to separate from the workplace or change careers. Um, we strongly encourage individuals to remain in the workplace for as long as they want to and are able to. But realistically, we know that there may be a time where somebody does need to start thinking about separating from the workplace. So I want you to know what their options are when and if that time comes. You wanna know what benefits are available to you at your employer. You know, are there benefits at work right now that you can be using? Um, check to see if you have private disability and private disability can be used to temporarily step away from work um, maybe you're going through a relapse and you just need some time to recoup and think about your next goals and then you return to work. Or it can be used to transition out of the workplace. And if it is used to transition out of the workplace, so if you're on private disability, you go on long-term disability, you're eventually going to need to apply to social security disability insurance as well. So again, I feel like I sound like a broken record, but part of it is being proactive and planning the best that you can. Um, knowledge is power. Uh, oftentimes we see people leave the workplace prematurely, which I mentioned earlier, and that can impact your household income and your ability to save for the future. And you may, be not, you may not have the employer-sponsored benefits if you're leaving your employment. And even if it's not prematurely, say you've exhausted all of your employment options, um, it's definitely something that you don't wanna take lightly and you wanna take time to plan for and do your research so that you are making the best decision for yourself because if you are transitioning out of the workplace, even if you have these benefits in place, you are gonna be living on less than you were when you were employed. So just a little bit more information about what private disability and social security disability insurance are. Um, with private disability, it's generally connect, connected through employment and sometimes individuals will have short-term disability and, so, and long-term disability. Sometimes people only have long-term disability, so you definitely wanna check what you have at your employer. And when you have your policies, you wanna take a look at them. There are key things that you'll want to know you know, how long does the benefit last? How much of your income is going to be replaced? Um, how is disability defined by your policy? And does your policy allow you to work? Uh, not all policies do, so you definitely wanna take a look at that. And then as I mentioned, if you're on long-term disability, you're going to need to apply for social security disability insurance at some point. Um, that's gonna vary with the policies as well as to when you need to do that. 
For Social Security Disability Insurance, it's a federal program through the Social Security Administration, and it's based on a person's work history, and the amount that you receive is gonna be based on, it's kind of a secret formula, <laughs> but it's the average of a person's earnings over their lifetime before they stopped working due to disability. You do have to have paid into Social Security taxes and have significant work history. And the reality of Social Security disability applying for it is that it's a long process. And we see people get denied, the majority of people get denied the first time around and often the second time around too. And that's not specific to MS, that's across the board. Um, and we do encourage individuals, you know, if you're going through that appeals process, to at least consider talking to an attorney to help you through that appeals process. They do work on a contingency basis, so you're not paying them lots of money up front. They only get paid if you get approved for benefits. Again, since it is a long process, you definitely want to plan financially the best that you can. Um, you are technically allowed to work part-time while you're applying for benefits, but there are certain limits that you need to stay within, and if you're making more than that, you're generally gonna be denied. You're gonna be considered gainfully employed. And then if you are receiving benefits, there are also work incentives in place that can allow a person to test out work in and not lose their cash benefits. So just a couple tips, because I've mentioned financial planning. Um, these are some general tips to help anybody plan for their financial future, but especially if you're somebody that's living with a chronic disability. And as newly diagnosed individuals, it's really good to start looking at your finances now and know what your situation is so that you can get a clear picture of your current financial situation. It's recommended that you have an emergency fund. Um, they say to start out with 500 to $1,000, but if you can get to a point where you can save to have your expenses covered for about three to six months it, to pay your bills and if there are some expected, unexpected um, costs that come up. And part of that, you know, also knowing what benefits your employer has. There's a lot of things listed here as examples of what could be available through your employer. Um, try, to, you know, try to become familiar with your benefits, your spouse's benefits if you have a spouse, and not make a rash decision. Just know what options you have and how they, you know, know what benefits you have, how they work, and how you can tap into them. One thing that you know, we get lots of questions about is health insurance. And if you're working um, with your health insurance, you know, good health insurance can be key. We know MS is an expensive disease. So you, you know, the best that you can plan um, during open enrollment, take a look at all the plans that are available to you and see which one is going to be the most cost effective to you. Um, if you're looking to transition out of the workplace, you know, health insurance continues to be a concern. And there are different options available to you. Um, one of them is COBRA. And COBRA, COBRA is pretty expensive. I think most people know that. <laughs> You're paying the full premium plus a 2% administration fee, but it allows you to continue your benefits. And there are other things you can look into as well, like the marketplace, or if you have a spouse to see if you can go on to their plan. But you know, just really doing your planning for what type of health insurance you have, because as I said, and you guys know, MS is an expensive disease, so anything that you can do to help plan for that well, is gonna help you. And then again, look into see if you have private disability through your employer. Another thing to think about when doing financial planning is working with professionals. Um, I have a couple resources listed here. The Financial Education Partners, or FEP, is a collaboration between the National MS Society and the Foundation for Financial Service Professionals. And it can be a good resource to help individuals affected by MS to kind of do some financial planning and look at insurance issues and um, 
you know, work towards figuring out what you need for the future. And you can call and speak with an MS navigator to see if you're eligible for that program. The other resources that I have listed here are ones to help you find a financial planner in your local area. And when you're speaking with a financial advisor, it's good to kind of interview them to see if they have what you are looking for. Um, you know, ask them questions. What's their background? What credentials do they have? Have they worked with individuals with MS before? How will they get paid? Um, what services do they offer? And keeping in mind what your goals are as well to make sure that it's a good match for you. And I just wanted to look at a couple additional resources. Of course, I'm gonna, you know, the National MS Society where I work, we have um, a variety of services available to you. We encourage you if you have questions about the topics we've discussed today or other topics related to MS to give us a call and speak with an MS navigator. You know, our goal is to connect individuals affected by MS, including spouses and support partners to get the information and resources and support that you need so that you can move your lives forward. And among the MS Navigator team is a smaller team uh, that focuses on benefits, employment, and health insurance. So you can certainly call and ask to speak with the benefits and employment support team if you have questions related to those topics, because um, we can give you some more information about these topics, as well as connect you to resources and information that may be needed. Definitely also check out our website. I mean, there's a ton of information on many, many topics, but there is a page dedicated to employment. There are several resources on there, no matter what stage of employment you're in, to help you. Um, there are some tools to help you with disclosure. You know, if you do wanna to put together a script, there's a worksheet on there that you can utilize to do that. And there's also a page for um, social security disability insurance where you're, there's a lot of frequently asked questions on there, as well as our guidebook that has a lot of information for applying for social security disability insurance and it's designed to be used with your healthcare provider as well. And these are just a few of our brochures uh, focusing on employment and then you can see the social security disability guidebook is there as well. You can visit the website, there's brochures on a variety of topics. And there is a, they call it a brochure, but it's a very long brochure. It's like, I don't even know how many pages, but the financial plan in one. Um, but it has a lot of great information in there to help you plan. Just a few more resources, there's the Career One Stops. And they are open to anybody, not just individuals with disabilities. And you know, you can go to them and utilize their services. You can check to see if they have a disability navigator program and they offer services similar to the vocational rehabilitation program. And sometimes in career one stops, individuals from vocational rehabilitation are housed in the office. So you can check with your local office. And then I've just included some disability friendly job boards here. If you're looking for a job, it's just, it's a place where you can go. There's uh, the employers are dedicated to hiring um, a diversified workplace. And so you can take a look at them. And then of course there's Can Do MS, which Anne talked to you in great detail about earlier, but I do encourage you to check out their website and their webinars. I know they've done a lot on employment and disability. So lots of information there as well. And that is all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, just a general question. If you do decide to disclose to your employer, let's say you disclose to the HR representative, are there any protections to contain that so that he doesn't disclose to everybody in the workspace? Is that a violation of HIPAA rights or how does that work? So if you're disclosing, there are certain people that, so if you disclose to HR, they legally cannot say that information to anybody else. When it comes to other individuals in the workplace, your supervisor, I mean, they, morally they should not be telling other people, but there, there aren't laws saying that they can't tell. And, and coworkers, the same thing. I mean, they can tell other people. Um, so it, it's really important to think about who you wanna tell and who you want to know.
Does that answer your question? My question is regarding life insurance. I've heard that if you're diagnosed with MS, it's literally impossible to get outside life insurance. Now, I do have life insurance with my job. However, I've heard that, you know, once you're diagnosed, um, outside life insurance will be de declined or denied. Is that true? It can be difficult. Um, it's not an automatic, you have MS, so you can't get life insurance. But the premiums can be more expensive. Um, you know, there may be more limitations on it. And you can also check with your one at work to see if it's portable or not. Um, some of them are, some of them aren't. Uh, my question is, um, my employer has been very accommodating, but I worry about her liability. If I were, if I were to fall and injure myself, um, and you know, do that? Does she have protection against that, or does her workman compensation have to jump in, or how is that? It's yeah, that's a, a great question. question. I don't know that I can fully answer it right now, but um, I mean, you, when you're working part under the ADA, I mean, you do need to be doing your job safely. There is a direct threat, they call it, or a safety concern under the ADA, so an employer can, you know, if they think that you're not able to do your job safely with or without reasonable accommodations, you know, they, they may have the right to let you go, but I know that's not really answering, you know, for your exact employer if they have protections. I don't know if <laughs> does that answer at all. <laughs> Well, we can get back to that question, and okay. um, yeah, Christina and I can um, kind of look for uh, help find some answers for that and get back to you, sir. Any other questions from the in person? I was just going to say, kind of to add on to that, if you've disclosed or not disclosed, would that make a difference to to maybe further look into that question? You know, if he hasn't disclosed and he falls, and uh, I don't know. Yeah, that, that and sense. that could lead to legal resources at least to do a consultation to see you know what the next best courts of action would be okay we did get a couple of questions from our virtual audience so christina deborah um, was wondering if the family medical leave act if you could clarify is that 12 weeks per year or 12 weeks in your lifetime total so it's there can be different ways that it is. It's generally 12 weeks in a year, but what that year looks like can be different from employers. Sometimes um, employers, it'll be, you know, it'll go the calendar year, January 1 to the December 31st. Other times it might be based on when you're hired. You know, there's a variety of ways that it can start and there can be a roll in 12 month period, but you, it's not you can get it more than once. <laughs> gotcha, so it's per year, mm -hmm. and, and whatever calendar year or 12 months that the employer right. defines, gotcha, okay. Um, and then Debbie um, asks, are there ways that an employer can still terminate or let you go um, by, and with getting around the protections that are in place? Well, um, most states are at will, so they can really let you go for any reason, um, you know, Trying part of the disclosing and educating the employers in hopes to not have that happen, but unfortunately we know that it does happen. So yeah, they can they can un find something if they are looking to to let you go um, because, uh, like I said, most states are at will states. Okay, any more questions from our in person audience? No. All right. Well, thank you, Christina. Yep. Oh, we do. Um, so this might kind of be high level, but I'm a business owner and I work an excessive amount of hours. Is there any correlation between progressing your disability by working 60 plus hours a week? Is there any correlation that maybe a certain amount of hours is helpful versus another? 
or is that kind of a personal each you know yeah I think it's kind of a personal question and it will vary and maybe we can talk a little bit between like one of the breaks yeah and, and we have other consultants that are here that are going to talk about uh, later on today Peggy Crawford is going to talk about fatigue and cognition um, and mood and kind of how all of those symptoms can interact with each other. Um, and I think working long hours certainly fit, that's impacted by fatigue and, and cognition as well. So perhaps um, Peggy might be able to touch on some of that. Um, but great questions. Any other questions? We've got a couple minutes left. Okay. Well, thank you, Christina. Right. Thank you, guys.